of a combination of uh, not simply uh, an exposition of the types of technology that we here offer at SuperDroid Robots, but just to kind of generally talk about um, robotic uh, tools for law enforcement in general. So first off, I'll start with some introductions of myself and uh, our, our other guest. My name is Patrick Fletchall. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for SuperDroid Robots. Um, I'm primarily responsible for <clears throat> a lot of the uh, outward communication uh, on the sales and business development side. But um, most recently, uh, the past year, I've been increasingly doing a lot of uh, hands-on uh, demonstrations of our robots uh, pretty much all over the country. So um, there's not really a corner I haven't gone to yet, and I've learned a lot about uh, about the use cases and about uh, feedback and uh, this is uh, kind of an interesting side note. One of the things that I'm, I'm really appreciative of uh, what we're currently doing is that uh, we are, our leadership is uh, extremely interested in making uh, tactical robot tools that are useful for our customers. And so we are actively shortening that feedback loop between taking your feedback as a person closest to the use, to how you use it, and uh, shortening that feedback loop to development to actually put those uh, those tools into place in the in the robots that we design. So that's a little bit about me. And then um, I'll introduce our uh, our guest Dylan Morgan, who is our tactical advisor for SuperDroid Robots, and you can tell a little about your experience. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm Dylan. Um, I uh, have a yeah previously worked there at SuperDroid Robots as a mechanical engineer. Um, that was part of my job. The other was um, I specialize with our tactical robots, um, usually performing demos and um, training for our tactical robots and um, just do working with the customer facing aspect of, uh, of that line of robots that we have. Um, so a lot of it was just, yeah, learning uh, what use cases would be helpful for, you know, police departments, fire departments, uh, different government agencies and that, that sort. Um, and uh, and that helped us develop and add different features and um, things that would help help these guys down the road. So, but. excellent. Thanks. Uh, so, let's see what I was going to say. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say. But anyway, so um, we're going to move on to uh, kind of why why use robots. And I know that this seems like kind of a, a, a no duh question, but when you're a company that makes Roughly, I think the number at this point is uh, 240 different kinds of robots, uh, many of which we're not even really allowed to talk about. Uh, there's there's a, a variety of different kind of applications, tools, sizes, uh, accessories, you name it, of the various robots we make. And so uh, on the topic of the question that I've been kind of asking myself of what makes a tactical robot, uh, the tactical side is, is what tools are on the robot uh, that make it a functional tool um, for for law enforcement for your use case. And just in general, in the robot world, there's kind of a, I'm not sure if you call it an acronym, but it's, there's kind of a rule of thumb, I guess, that you'd say in, uh, in why you use robots in the first place. And not all of these apply to law enforcement, but many of them do. Um, I guess if you just kind of go down through the list of checking off what applies to, to uh, law enforcement, um, are there situations in law enforcement that are considered dirty? Yes, I think there there certainly are. I, I can think of one uh, use case where a Boston Dynamic uh, dog recently had a uh, an interesting run in with a uh, a completely naked uh, suspect that was <laughs> basically accosting the uh, the robot. That definitely qualifies as dirty in my case. Um, is uh, law enforcement dull? I'm not sure if that one applies here. I don't think there's much that's very dull about law enforcement. Uh, but is there is there situations in which ro uh, robots are used in dangerous situations? Absolutely. And then uh, we like to kind of add like a fourth one of those. Dirty, dull, and dangerous is kind of like the three that you always hear about in robotics. But we also like to talk here about uh, the, the fourth D, which we consider distant. And the reason being is that the the primary reason that you use robots in law enforcement is to create distance between yourself and the uh, and the potential danger, and and I might in, in thinking about this I might even uh, in 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 using robots for distance I might even include like a fifth D quite frankly I'd probably 
it's probably not a good one, but I'd probably include decision because uh, the more individuals that I talk to in SWAT and EOD, the way that they're using robots is to, to not just be able to have uh, an understanding of a scenario and an environment and the players involved. Uh, if you're in a house, you see where the crib is, you see where grandma's sitting watching TV, you see where the person of concern is, but you're also creating an understanding of the environment and, and in order to make a strategic decision as to um, how you're going to approach the situation. Of course, understanding that uh, it's it's fluid, but there are certain things in place that can influence your decision and how you approach the environment in a way that keeps everybody safe. So that's that's uh, that's one very good reason. Now, in terms of using robots, robots are tools. Uh, anybody who's used you know any kind of like construction tools or just tools for um, building things understands that there's a big difference between a driver drill and a hammer drill. Um, any, if, if you've ever tried to use a driver drill to drill into concrete, you know that it's not going to work very well. But then all of a sudden you pick up a, a hammer drill and you're just cutting through the through the concrete like it's butter. So the same is true with robots. Uh, you got to have the right gear for the job. And there's you don't you you need to have the right tool for the right situation or or you're not going to have the right solution. So like I said, we make 240 different kinds of robots, uh, everything ranging from really small confined space robots that can go into you know almost eight inch pipes all the way to to large heavy robots for security, robots that can manipulate their environment, robots that can go up as like you're seeing here, robots that can elevate themselves to a, a, a high position. Uh, there's various reasons why you need to do that. But really, uh, it, it comes down to having the right gear for the job. But it's most useful to be talking about uh, basically real-world use cases. So um, this is where I'm going to bring in Dylan to, to talk a little bit more uh, on the real-world use cases. Um, so moving on to, uh, to the next slide. Uh, one use case that we've we've discovered is what we would consider a confined space environment. So, uh, in a UVI or under vehicle inspection, um, the the typical way in which that is done, the cheapest and the sort of most common way in which that's done, is by using mirrors, and that's what you you see all the time. Uh, but there are benefits to the mirrors, which is that they're cheap and they're easy to use. You don't really require a lot of training, but um, if you're using robots to create distance from potential hazards and dangers. Um, it's it's not going to create. It's still you got to use it in close proximity to the potential uh, danger. So, robots for under vehicle, for UVIs is a is a good solution for being able to create that distance while at the same time even potentially uh, integrating with uh, other UVI systems uh, such as um, external uh, camera systems that are doing license plate recognition or recording the uh, the engagement. Um, I'm curious, Dylan. I, I have you spoken with anybody in the past about uh, UVIs? Well, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, this is uh, something I've I've brought up before that um, even compared to mirrors. I mean, uh, this, as you can see right here. I mean, this gives you way better eyes on, um, you know, for the, this example for a vehicle, uh, you know, inspecting underneath it. Um, yeah. Whereas maybe a mirror might miss something uh, that's maybe more centered or more obscured or underneath uh, some kind of fairing, you know, that um, you can get right up close and personal with it. And as you said, you also giving yourself a little distance from it as well. And um, yeah, so that this, yeah, this is something that's come before different uh, departments that were curious about it. So I would also say that that documentation is important. So the ability to not just right. you can't document looking into a mirror. The ability to be able to do an under vehicle inspection, both for documentation of an incident, but also for training purposes. Uh, it's it's always nice to have multiple pairs of eyes, um, and also using it for training purposes that you can actually train somebody to spot spot something for, um, or for documenting a, a you know when something you actually spot something. So. Um, other uh, potentially, so the the robot that we're using potentially for the, uh, for example, for this under vehicle inspection, is also one that you use for uh, for confined space inspection. So robots are are particularly useful for not just being able to get into spots that you can't get into, but also get into spots that you may not potentially uh, 
want to get into. And I'll, I'll tell kind of a funny story. I won't name names because I don't want to call anybody out, but I had a very, very, like literally two weeks ago, I had a kind of a funny story that happened where I did a demo. Every time I go to these demos, I always bring, of course, our, our bulldog tactical, which has the arm, multi-axis arm, but I also bring my confined space, uh, GPK is what we call it, a confined space robot everywhere I go. Just as an example of kind of a, a, a quick and easy thing you can toss into a room and it can, it can just go with, uh, from room to room. What was interesting was that the individuals, they liked the Bulldog, but they, uh, they looked at the GPK and they're like, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry. There's just not a lot of these scenarios that we go into. We, we never go underneath the house. We don't go into crawl spaces. We don't go into air ducts. We don't go into this kind of thing. But, you know, thank you for showing us this. It's kind of cool. So later that night, I'm, it's 1030 at night. I literally have my ZQL in my hand. I'm about to take my ZQL and go to bed. And I get a call. And it's uh, the sergeant that I spoke with, and he's like, hey, uh, is, is it too late? And it was very unusual, and I said, no, it's not too late. What, what can I do for you? Are you still, are you still uh, in town? I was like, yes, I'm still in town. And he proceeded to tell me, you know, we've, we've got a manhunt in our way, and uh, we've, we actually have a, a potential suspect under, in the crawl space of a house. And uh, I was wondering if you still had that crawl space robot uh, <laughs> handy. So I, I just started laughing, and I just said, tell me where you need me to go. It was it was great though. So just to highlight that you 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 literally don't know what what tool you're going to need until you absolutely need it. Um, I don't, Dylan, do you have any other examples? I mean, I I personally haven't come across too many guys with this specific uh, situation, but I have kind of said that too. Where um, having yeah different tools in your toolbox is always a good thing to have, and um, even if you have something like this GPK in tandem with one of the larger robots, yeah. like a Mastiff or a Bulldog is good just to even have a, another set of eyes or a third person perspective. And then also just gives you options too for different scenarios you might run into. So it does. Plus, I mean, the GPK is, is I mean, there almost no retra- training is required. I've, I've actually taken this to my yeah. kid's kindergarten class and it's one stick driving. And so you just basically hand it to somebody and you can have somebody else having another eye as we're, as you're going yeah. clearing through through the rooms. Um, at, at a most at two weeks ago at a demo, I had the GPK, this confined space robot. I had this operating next to the bulldog. We had a drone going. We had two other robots going simultaneously in the room, and you know there was no interference. We were all basically going through rooms together. It was really interesting. Uh, another use case uh, is is uh, in search and rescue efforts. So. Um, one part of the country that I've I've done demos at in um, I think it's considered southern I think it's still considered northern California um, has quite a you know, unfortunately quite a large uh, homeless and displaced population who frequently take um, take refuge in the storm drains of of the city and start fires to keep themselves warm in the storm drains so they had a situation recently where they had a fire they thought that the uh, they thought that the uh, individuals were stuck in the storm drain. So they were getting people suited up. They did a little heat check in there, and it was about 1,000 degrees is what they said it was. And uh, they had an entrance to another tunnel that they were going to go to make sure that to, they thought they were basically doing body recovery. But they didn't realize that there were extern- there were other exits that the, uh, the individuals had, had left. But in a lot of times, they're, they're checking to make sure if people are still alive before they send one of their people into an extremely dangerous environment. And so uh, they are procuring a, a robot for precisely this kind of scenario where it's a confined space. It's a, it's a dangerous space simply because it's confined. If something can go wrong, it's going to go wrong in a confined space. And so um, having a first pair of eyes to go through there, uh, the, the video, by the way, that you're seeing here is actually one of our customers that um, they used to have for context, this space is basically two feet by about one and a half feet. So two feet tall, one and a half feet wide. And this is a flu of a, um, the flu of a, uh, uh, basically for steel manufacturing. And their current, their previous way of inspecting this is having the smallest guy in the factory shimmy his way through here. Uh, and it's hot. It's usually close to hundred degrees. He's suited up with hazmat and mask and They've had some situations that they have had nobody die yet or get injured, but they have had situations where people have panicked and uh, ash has collapsed around them. And, uh, you know, reading the writing on the wall, it's only a matter of time before they're going to have to rescue somebody from this space. So by using a robot for that, they can get 
even better inspections here, but more importantly, nobody has to to rescue the robot. Um, it's it can go in that environment. Anything you I was gonna, think of adding? Yeah, I mean, uh, not, not specific to confined spaces, but even just on the note of the uh, this robot though too. And so, you know, I've uh, at the time when I was there, you know, I was, I was looking into uh, different uh, applications for like a proper throw robot. And um, while we don't, uh, as far as I know, don't have one uh, at this point, but this this has been used in the past, and I've talked to different. Um, agencies about it before too, where it's good for, um, even if you have a team entering a building, clearing rooms, you can utilize this robot to maybe go do a surveillance of the next room uh, before you clear it. So you kind of know what you're getting into. So it's uh, it's handy for, for that kind of purpose as well. And I think this is a good foray into, I mean, this represents a hazardous environment. I, I, I'm of the opinion, of course, that any confined space is a potentially hazardous environment. I mean, if you in a previous life, I, I did a lot of work in confined space comms. And uh, gosh dang, if anything went wrong, it usually always went wrong in a confined space. So there are there are other areas, of course, where there are hazardous environments that are not necessarily confined, still considered hazardous. And so if you go to the next slide and then the, the one after that, we're going to go over a, a few of those uh, hazardous environments that, that robotics are phenomenal for. So this is an example of... Uh, that's the thing about it, working in law enforcement. You never know what kind of situation or environment you're going to be in because they're constantly changing. Um, robots are, are, especially our robots, have been utilized for um, excellent ways of being able to have uh, do some inspections of hazardous environments like gas, uh, toxic or, or even inert gases that displace the oxygen in an environment to be able to detect whether there's gas present before sending in uh, a person. So the picture that you're seeing here is actually a, a picture from one of our customers where periodically uh, at a substation, they would have a catastrophic uh, failure of a substation uh, insulator, which would crack and leak SF6 gas. And that SF6 gas is an inert gas. It's not dangerous, but it pools. It's very heavy, so it pools down, and then it displaces the oxygen. And they potentially had a, a scenario where they sent in a repair person, technician, and he had a, a cardiac failure, and he collapsed uh, on the ground, and he wasn't breathing oxygen anymore. So fortunately, they were able to get him out, and it was had a happy ending, but they realized that they couldn't be sending in – you can't see it, so they couldn't be sending in anybody and, uh, without knowing that it was safe first. So their solution to that was to send in basically guys in scuba tanks. I don't really know what they're called when you're not using it in water, but basically just full air tanks. And then they would take gas readings and circular you know, spiral pattern until they got to the, the location of the failure. Uh, by using a robot, you not only save time, but you save, uh, they were able to eliminate all that equipment, which was very costly and difficult to maintain. And with a, a gas uh, detection monitor, uh, taking at different elevation readings, which is possible to do with robotics and our robots in, in particular, they were able to go directly to the source of the failure and uh, confirm or deny the existence of gas. Um, this is also a similar situation that we're working with the with the Environmental Protection Agency, taking uh, uh, talk with uh, integrating toxic vapor analyzer with robots, and really, robots are just a phenomenal integration tool for any kind of sensor that you might necessarily want to put in for a hazardous uh, environment to prevent harm from people. Um, other potential hazardous environments, of course, are doing fire inspections. So typically when I, uh, when there's an area that has experienced a fire, uh, the area, these uh, structure is no longer stable. So Putting people in there first and foremost, uh, even accidentally bumping into something or kicking something can dislodge something structural to cause a collapse. So using our robots, which are, you know, some of our customers have in the past, as sort of a first pair, first in tool to go in and kind of understand the situation, understand where the dangers might lie structurally, uh, maybe even get in there and see something uh, that could assist in a, a fire investigation. Uh, is is an excellent way of using robots before you put anybody unnecessarily in harm's way. Have you encountered these situations, yeah. Dylan? Yeah, um, one of the ones that really comes to mind is uh, Riverside Fire Department. Um, I, I believe they're based out of, out of California, and um, yeah, they that's probably one of the most heavily used uh, 
robots that I've seen because uh, they had to come back to us for repair because they use it in a um, situation similar to this where they uh, were using the arm to remove uh, debris. And um, and it was just a really, it was really uh, kind of a, a wild atmosphere. And so it was just a, yeah. a lot of stress on the robot. And, and they were happy with how it performed, but um, there was just, uh, it just, Took took a little beat, bit of a beating, so uh, sent it back to us, and yeah, it definitely had some some scars <laughs> to show from it, but um, it, was, it was still working. So, yeah, you know th- that's the thing though. So the robot had some scars, some dents, and whatever, but that's a person that did not have scars and dents. So I mean, that's right. w- whenever we get a robot back that has some damage from having been put in a f- hazardous environment where a person where people got to go home at the end of the day. That's that's when we get pretty excited as uh, builders of robots. Um, if there's a robot that comes back with a bullet hole, we get especially excited. Um, personally, I think they look better in black than red, but you know, whatever the customer prefers, if they like a red uh, robot, that's perfectly fine. Um, let's see. Moving on to uh, nuclear environments. So these are these are some interesting scenarios that we've encountered. Uh, I've got a couple stories, but I'm curious from your experience previously, prior to me, Dylan. What have you encountered in this? Uh, well, uh, a company that immediately comes to mind is Canadian Nuclear. Um, they've uh, they they had a kind of several, I believe, robots from us uh, to do um, radiation detection uh, in some of the facilities, and um, they were um, had a really good relationship with them too. And um, they uh, they seem to be happy with the how the robots were performing in those environments because they kept boarding one and then another and another so um yeah but um but yeah i mean just yeah the as you've been saying it's just another uh, situation where a person doesn't necessarily need to be in that environment so it, it's it's similar on the topic of the kind of scenarios that law enforcement have to go into that, that you just you wouldn't expect so one uh, customer that i was speaking with um their airport police so they nuclear is something that's very consistently on their on their mind um that if there's a, a potentially nuclear threat at the airport, um, they, it's it's an EOD situation. It's a little bit beyond even an EOD situation where not only is it a, is a potential bomb threat, but it's also a potential nuclear bomb threat. So having a robot being able to go into a hot environment uh, and be able to take readings and manipulate an object um, before a person has to is excellent. Another um, interesting, fascinating use case is um, consistently hot environments so uh, nuclear decommissioning uh, there is a scenario in which um, the customers have to put people in to take to paint samples metal samples soil samples but they can only once they put a person in person obviously can only stay in there for a short amount of time but then when they exit they can't go back into that environment for another two years so they just have a rotation of people that when they go need to go in that person can't go in for two years but then the next person goes in with a robot, this is uh, an interesting use case for robotics where the robot basically goes into those environments and then they stay hot. They don't leave. Um, they live on site, charging on site, and then they take the soil samples when they need to and they don't ever leave that. They become part of the facility, basically. So that's an area where you can not only save people from un- unnecessary danger, but uh, you can get what you need um, every single time and they just live on site. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the uh, next slide. This is this is an interesting use case. Now, Dylan, I think this is even after your time, right? That we were starting to talk about reality capture and digital twinning. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah, I don't think this was. Um, I think it was. People, yeah, we had talked about it, but I don't think it. Uh, yeah. We had dealt into it too much at the time. So this is our newest sort of. I uh, newest by I say that in the last year. Uh, foray into uh, crime scene recreation. So um, historically, uh, with technology, this has been done a lot with uh, with drones. Uh, but there are certain scenarios in which drones may or may not be a good solution for crime scene for digital twinning. There's lots of different names for it, reality capture, digital twinning, um, crime scene recreation. Uh, but sometimes the drone isn't a good use case because it may be in proximity to like a heliport or a uh, an airport, or it may be a GPS denied area. And uh, or it just might be a kind of environmental area where flying a drone around might be very difficult. So we've gotten into uh, using our robots integrated with reality capture equipment 
And when it comes to this kind of reality capture equipment, we're pretty agnostic. Um, we, we like to work with our customers on the sensors that they like to use, uh, right down to the fact like this GPK that you're seeing here, uh, they run off a DeWalt battery. And the reason for that is that everybody's got a million of those lying around. They've got like 10 in their truck. Uh, but if you prefer Milwaukee, we'll use Milwaukee. You like something else, we'll use something else. But we're pretty agnostic when it comes to sensors. But using uh, robotics to uh, remotely, so you can you can have uh, people kind of stepping off site and you can have a, a robot driving around the crime scene, paying attention to not touching what it ought not to touch and recreating it into a digital environment is uh, something that we're very excited about. In fact, uh, next week, uh, myself and the uh, CMO and the CEO are actually going to be traveling to a uh, reality capture conference in Boise next week uh, because it's an area that we're, we're increasingly seeing interest in and we're increasingly interested in being in. So that's an exciting one. So the customers that we typically speak with the most are, of course, SWAT and EOD. And they, they overlap in terms of their use uh, use cases, but they also have slightly different needs. Um, whereas EOD needs to have a, a broader range of tools and needs to be methodical and careful. Uh, sometimes, you know, SWAT is just about getting in there, understanding the environment, clearing rooms ahead of SWAT going in. Um, so one of the best uses for our, our robotics is, is just kind of doing recon. So whether you're needing to go up high and look into something like a car or go down low and look under a bed. Um, one scenario I remember uh, speaking with a customer about was they were talking to a guy and he was sitting on the bed and he was telling him, I don't have any weapons. I don't have any weapons. He was telling them. And then they basically put a robot in and they looked, they just rolled it up and they could see underneath the bed was just a cache of weapons. So that was inaccurate. So being able to uh, look high, look low, understand the environment, know what you're dealing with, can't always assume people are telling the truth, uh, that's that's essential recon. That provides you critical intelligence that you can go into a scenario uh, with armed with the right information uh, to keep people safe. So this is uh, also highlighting that in addition to kind of the, uh, the GPK for an, an UVIs, you can also uh, utilize the same kind of, so if you have a more general purpose tool, such as the, uh, the Bulldog, which you see pictured here, uh, you, can, you can do under vehicle inspections using, um, can't really, you can see it if you look on the right side of the screen. The Bulldog has <clears throat> basically four different kinds of cameras. You've got the front tilt pan and zoom camera with low, array, low wave infrared. Uh, you've got the nose camera, which it's using for inspecting under the vehicle. You've also got your over-the-shoulder uh, 30 times optical zoom camera, and then of course a rear, uh, a rear camera as well. And you can see those in both quad mode and individual mode. So you have a variety of different views and angles to, with which to be able to recon an environment. I was going to add too that the uh, the bulldog there is. Uh, um, Probably one of more popular robots because it's of its size and it's uh it's modular too. So um, you know, with the arm being removable, you you have access to uh, essentially a bloodhound um, for more surveillance purposes. Um, but this one's definitely popular. SWAT and EOD just before um, because it, it can serve many roles. And I've actually talked to different departments that were SWAT and EOD were kind of. Uh, Fell, fell into the same umbrella and um, so the use case could you know they, they could utilize it depending on uh, which which team needed it at the time or if they're both happen to be there that they could use it for that too but you know I, I agree I, I actually would like to kind of um, stay on this slide for just a brief moment because this is a good this is a good example of both a multi-purpose SWAT and EOD tool but also to highlight the quick feedback loop that we've done in terms of getting feedback from law enforcement and then implementing them. So you can't see in this picture, but I kind of want to highlight some of the things that we've done to change. So on the side of the robot, one of the changes that we made previous was that rather than just plugging it in, uh, we wanted to have the batteries accessible on the sides. So if you're in the field, you're getting already about four hours, correct me if I'm wrong, Dylan, about four hours of runtime on the bat on the robots. 
varies, varies on usage, usage. Before, like okay. the, the average yeah okay but then when you want to basically double that you just pop the biters out pop new ones in and you're off and running again the uh the onboard control unit gets around eight and there's also field a field battery that you can use to extend the uh the life of that of that uh onboard control unit the controller um or you can actually plug it into the inverter of your car uh to keep it running indefinitely so other changes that are worth mentioning is that we've actually enclosed the chain motors um, to ensure that things don't get stuck in it. We uh, the common feedback that we received was that uh, the the uh, the robots typically get kind of stuck on clothes, particularly uh, ladies' clothes, and they get stuck in the uh, in the treads. And what I've commonly seen in some of our competitors is that they have flippers that are also treads, and so you've got treads going kind of in different directions and going multiple times. So clothes get typically caught in between those treads. We have a flipper for getting up and down stairs and over obstacles, but by enclosing the chain motors, we've also eradicated the danger of getting stuck on clothes. So we actually are going to be releasing a video uh, with a variety of different clothes that we've tried to get stuck on. And uh, we, we just, we don't get stuck. Other changes we've yeah, made. If, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just, I was going to just uh, add to that. Just that, uh, that the feedback we get from um, from uh, the customers and from people who have used it, or even just even times that I've done training or uh, or demos with people, that they just have suggestions or ideas, or like, well, what about this or that, and it's all very valuable information because we on our end we uh, you know we have ideas, but um, just talking to the end user about what is the most practical, what what kind of uh, situations or what kind of features we can add to help them, um, you know, in the field. So it's all really good information. Yeah, I mean, right down to the fact that, you know, somebody said, hey, um, I periodically have to carry this a block. Could you put handles on it? Instantaneously, we put handles on the front and back. It makes it much easier just even to carry. Uh, it, like uh, Dylan said, the the base of this Bloodhound is actually, I'm sorry, the base of the Bulldog is actually our Bloodhound platform. So if you, there's just four bolts holding the arm in place, you unbolt those uh, with an Allen wrench, uh, unplug, and then the arm comes off easily, and it's just flush and flat, and that becomes the Bulldog. And you've got the uh, 30 times optical zoom on the back, so that becomes a a great recon uh, robot that can go up and down stairs. Four bolts, you put the arm back on, and now you can manipulate the environment. So and also that that camera mask comes off too. So if, yes. uh, if if you need it, like this, even in this picture slide, if you want that that uh, robot to go into the vehicle, um, you you can take both of those off and you can use that tilt nose tilt camera to uh, inspect under the vehicle for as an example. Our basic philosophy when it comes to um, dur durability and reliability is that. We want you to be basically to be able to use it, and if uh, if something goes wrong, like Dylan was talking about with the with the uh, the fire where it got some dents and bruises, um, it, it should still work. So the, one of the first things that people notice when they see the bulldog, when they see any of our robots, really, is is that they are extremely well made. They're tools. They're they're vehicles. The arm itself is durable. It can take it can take a beating. The the chassis itself is rugged and durable. Uh, there's actually even uh, Interestingly enough, there was an influencer that did an unboxing fairly recently of one of our smaller crawl space robots. And we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't ask him to do it, but he was doing an unboxing of it. And when he took it out of the box, the first thing he thought of was like, this is a real tool. Like, this, thing is, this isn't plastic at all. So as opposed to some components of, of not to knock competitors, but you know, some components where if it rolls over, arm snaps. You know, there's trade-offs for making it lighter versus durability. We go the durable route. So the Bloodhound itself weighs around 55 pounds. You add the arm to it, that adds another 30. Uh, but with that, you get not just durability, but power. So you can lift around, uh, close to the body, you can lift about 35 pounds. And then ex you know, fully extended, like you see it here, it can lift about 15. So it's tough and strong. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Uh, again, what similar to sensors, I mean, when it comes to other kind of accessories and tools that you need to use, such as hot gas or disruptors, I get a lot of questions, I'm sure Dylan does, uh, on, you know, what kind of, how do you do hot gas deployment, how do you do disruptor deployment? Uh, short answer to that question is yes, and how do you want it deployed? Um, sometimes it's as simple as just having a Picatinny rail on the arm. 
Um, and other times it, it requires something a little bit more uh, creative. But yes, we have both experience with hot glass, gas deployment, uh, disruptor deployment, uh, different kinds of disruptor mounts, uh, you name it. So uh, Dylan, anything you want to add on that? I get those questions a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we yeah, we, I, I, yeah, we've gotten those questions a lot too. Um, and oftentimes, it, depending on what it is they're asking for, it's easier, or it's, it's just to, for the sake of liability, depending on what it is they're asking to put on the robot, we offer, you know, to mount or to provide a mount for it, but not the actual device itself, depending on what it is. But, um, but yeah, I mean, everything from, yeah, just kind of high C here, like smoke or CS gas deployment. Um, even launcher systems on the robot. Um, uh, you know, it, of course, there's always the questions of mounting weapons on it, but that's kind of where I was going back to. <laughs> that's a, that becomes more of a liability thing. So, <clears throat> you know, actually, um, I <clears throat> I just had a conversation with the CEO of Carbon Fire just recently, and and if if you need us to procure and install, um, we we can do that as well. So. <laughs> Now, going off into a kind of going off into accessories in the next slide of. Uh, oh, OK, first, actually, a hostage negotiation. So one of the things that's important to note on both the Bulldog and the Mastiff is that there's and, and the and the Bloodhound as well is uh, we have extremely sensitive and excellent um, two way uh, audio tools as well. And I would say that hostage negotiation or even just kind of victim like crisis management um, being able to communicate both ways in a lot of in a lot of times can actually de-escalate, as you know, it can, can de-escalate uh, scenarios. So um, there's a scenario. Actually, I'll let you, Dylan, I'll let you tell you about the, uh, the Fuquay Verena because you probably were were there when that happened, right? Uh, Fuquay PD. Fuquay PD. Uh, oh, are you talking about the guy uh, that was the barricaded suspect yes. and that kind of thing? Oh, yeah. So. Um, well, that one's kind of a funny situation, uh, was, yeah, the guy was a barricaded suspect. And so they had to use the, I believe it was a bulldog. Yeah. That they, uh, used to go in the house, um, which, uh, so they actually had to go through multiple rooms, open doors, then they had to take it upstairs. Um, and they got to the top of the video or, uh, top of the, um, stairs and they saw the guy up there, um, uh, I think he was laying on the ground at the time and rising top of the stairs. Um, unfortunately, one of the, the chains on the robot, uh, uh, drive chains broke, so they didn't have drive on one side of the robot. Um, but they were able to communicate with the guy the two, using two-way audio. And the guy was a, guy was actually being helpful because he was saying, like, hey, do you need me to move this robot over to one side or the <laughs> other? So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and... Uh, but it, 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 anyway, they got to where they needed to be, and then they were able to uh, effectively uh, communicate with him and um, and resolve the situation. So excellent. That's good to hear. Uh, fortunately, the uh, enclosing the chain motors has effectively solved that that issue. So that's that's been resolved, which is good to know. All right. So moving on to the next. Uh, let's see. We're getting into. So we have our technician on the side helping us with, there we go, object manipulation. So when you need more than simply um, simply an eye doing recon, uh, in many situations, uh, when you, especially like if you're doing room clears or if you need to move an object or remove an object, um, the multi-axis arm is extremely uh, useful for object manipulation. One of the things I, I want to draw attention to on the multi-axis arm of ours, as opposed to it's it's helpful to know differences between ours and potential competitors, is that um, in in a lot of uh, onboard controlled units or or um, the controllers for, for for alternative robots, EOD and SWAT robots, you typically have to select the motor that it is that you want to move. So if you want to move the shoulder motor, you press that, you move it. If you want to move the wrist, you press the button for that, you move it. So it, the positives of that is that it, it requires you, particularly for EOD situations, 
it, it requires you to be much more strategic and methodical about how you move things. But there are many situations, particularly in SWAT, where you want to be a little bit more intuitive and clear rooms a little faster than, than simply selecting motors. So our motors um, all work independently of each other, particularly on the OCU. So you can actually be moving all the joints simultaneously with each other. So the reason I highlight that is that you can, the more you use it, the more you train on it, you can actually become as intuitive with how you use the arm as you are with your own arm. I mean, with your own arm, you can move your wrist while you're moving your elbow. And so you can do that similar with the robot. So as you're approaching a door, you can be reaching out to it, getting your arm in position to be able to grasp the door, open the door, move through, move on to the next room. So intuitive object manipulation is critical for creating, uh, for, for doing things with efficiency um, as is uh, a variety of different uh, ways to manipulate the environment, um, whether it's accessories such as uh, such such as the, uh, the the clippers and and what other kind of accessories have you seen, Dylan? Uh, yeah, so I mean, you got nips here, and then um, you know we've also used things such as like uh, tire punches, uh, window punches, um, disruptors, and uh, yeah, the disruptors, of course, and then. Um, even have a um, a hook too for um, uh, usually used in a situation where if you need a you're trying to pull someone out of a hazardous situation it's a you the hook goes into the uh, the manipulator and usually tethered to someone back at, back behind the robot and then you know you clip it on someone or something and then you can pull them but it's also good too if you you know if you're trying to grab something uh, that uh, maybe it's a little tricky for the, the gripper to get that um, you can use the hook for as well. Yeah. So I'm going to have to, in the time that we're having remaining, I'm going to go a little bit faster um, in talking about uh, robots for security as well. So um, obviously, uh, as time has gone by, we've actually, uh, you're seeing more and more of autonomous ro robots or semi-autonomous. So a robot that is enabled with semi-autonomy of being able to, uh, with with simple commands able to auto automatically do things. But um, at SuperDroid Robots, we have a variety of different automation platforms or automation development platforms. The one that you're seeing here is our HK1500, which is a very robust, very powerful uh, autonomous robot platform. Uh, one customer that I spoke with fairly recently, they'd uh, procured one of these about a year ago. And when I called to ask how things were going with it, uh, they said, oh, it's great. We, uh, we actually strapped 660 pounds of armor plating on it took it to the Arizona desert for two weeks and we shot at it from helicopters with a 50 caliber machine gun and it worked great. Got it back and it worked great. I thought, well, it definitely voids the warranty, but uh, I'm glad to hear that it worked fine being shot at from a helicopter. We have no idea how some of our customers are using our robots, but um, one scenario in which a security robot is effective is being not just reactive to uh, potential threats, but also proactive. Um, one use case that we were discussing with uh, customers is, a uh, robotic patrol for u utility substations. They're losing hundreds of millions in copper theft. And being able to have a, a security patrol to be able to live on site, whether it's a substation or a facility or a warehouse, uh, to be able to do active monitoring patrols, uh, react to motion or, or ingress, is, uh, is critical for being able to deter, deter theft and crime. So I want to stop, make sure that we answer any questions uh, before we kind of close with a with the last thing. And it's okay if there aren't any, but we we love questions. Oh, you can also type the questions in the chat if uh, if that works better for you. So I will, um, I'm going to move on to the next slide and, and feel free to, to, as you're, if you're typing in your question, feel free to go ahead and type it in. Um, in the meantime, um, one of the most, uh, one of the things that I would say is service, but also just as use, useful is that um, when you're trying to justify uh, a robot tool uh, for your organization, it's, it's useful to create a business case. Now, you understand your use case better than we ever could, uh, but 
we have a lot of experience in assisting and creating those business cases. So in the context of law enforcement, I think we're at a really, really good point where robotics have been used for many, many years in law enforcement, but there, it's, there has been a little bit of justification over the past few years that robots have had to, had to do some heavy lifting in justifying their existence in law enforcement. But I think that we've reached a point where it has the, uh, the usefulness of it has permeated the different levels of decision makers within law enforcement such that um, leadership within law enforcement is, has, has understood the value that robots cr uh, create in not just creating distance from danger, but also in the ability to um, understand the environment and be able to strategically use them uh, to, to, uh, to solve problems in a way that protects, uh, protects the community in better ways. So um, we have a lot of experience in assisting and creating those use cases. And uh, at this point, I, I actually, there's, a, there's another guest that's on uh, here, but I didn't introduce him. He's, a, he's our CMO, Perrin, uh, who I, is usually the person that I recruit when I, need to, uh, when I need to talk mostly about the use case. So I wanted to introduce Perrin, our uh, CMO, and uh, see if you have any thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Yeah, with police, it's not a clear business case as we would see in you know, a commercial business or something like that. Usually, commercial business is all about efficiency and things like that. But with you know law enforcement, it's about you know, risk reduction. And you know, it's, unfortunately, there is a dollar amount when it comes to workman's comp or even death, you know, untimely death. There is an insurance plan for that that the, the police department has or the sheriff's office has. They know what dollar amount. So you're not always going to kind of come into it and saying, you know, if we spend this much money on this tool that will save this much. But you're going to come out as more as risk. If we do this, this reduces our risk. You're not even a percentage, but just this allows us to better protect the citizens. You know, like we've talked about with, you know, going into a a, um, a a building, you can now see what's in the environment and make a better plan for the SWAT team to come in. Um, we even had, you know, one police department was asking us, can we build a robot that can actually hold like the shield for the SWAT team to enter instead of having somebody have their legs exposed? You know, those are different things that we can help with reducing risk. So it, it's much more of a, this idea of risk reduction uh, and safety. We see a little bit more on the construction side as well, because constructions and manufacturing are so heavy on safety, um, they're not necessarily using the term risk. So you know, if there's something that's interested, we can definitely help you guys put some of those numbers. But most likely somebody in your your team, in your department, has these specific numbers. And if you can say, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense when you're working with people that are just financially focused and you focus on that budget. If they're trying to line item a large purchase like a robot or even some of the smaller robots, that if you can say this buying this cause this X results in this Y results are usually a lot you know more open to it than just saying hey this is a cool robot um, so that's what we put this on the end is a lot of people still kind of have this idea of robots are cool they're not used to using them um, and there is some like indirect cost that helps with recruiting um, but some of that recruiting isn't necessarily because the robots are cool it's also because people are seeing the robots are helping to save them you know, that's what we're seeing as well, even in our industries like manufacturing and construction that we're, we're taking people out of these dirty and dangerous situations that Patrick let off with. So it's kind of what are the direct cost of yeah. the saving and the insurance or the, you know, the life or workman's comp insurance? And then what are the indirect things where it could come into the recruiting and just the overall safety of the, the law enforcement? Thank you. What? One of the things, to, so as we close, uh, there's a couple things that I wanted to draw attention to, which is we're receiving more and more um, interest in, in uh, scheduling demos. So uh, just to let you know that um, we are actively taking uh, inquiries of, of demos uh, for the different robots that uh, all around the country. And so the way that we're approaching that is that, you know, it's we have limited personnel resources, which is par partly me, uh, partly others, but we are planning uh, groups of demos. So, for example, um, I just did Texas, all the whole state of Texas a couple weeks ago. Uh, a couple weeks before that, I did Florida. And uh, pretty soon, I'm going to be in Southern California. And then in November, I'm going to be uh, doing a little tour up in Washington, state of Washington. So if there's uh, an interest in a demo, um, wherever it is, just reach out to, to me. Um, or or SuperDroid in general, and just let us know. Uh, my email is p Fletchall. That's p as in Patrick, f as in Frank, l e t c h a l l at sdrobots.com. And um, 
otherwise my phone number is 225-433-2043 and happy to uh happy to see if that fits in with uh, some of the other um, demos we're going to be doing in your area the last thing that i want to draw your attention to is that um we're a, we're a fairly unique technology company and you can go to the last slide with our website um we're a fairly unique technology company in that we don't think that you need you should have to oh by the way that that's a, a picture of our weatherproofed robot took a lot of time to come up with that just kidding <laughs> So we're a unique company in that we uh, we don't think that you should have to reach out to us to find out how much stuff costs and to be able to get specs and information. So our website is pretty much our one-stop shopping when it comes to uh, information, videos, um, uh, spec sheets, details, as well as pricing. The pricing you see on the website is what you is what you can expect. So everything is there. Uh, and then lastly, our YouTube channel is probably where we get the majority of our traffic. So. Our YouTube channel at Super Droid Robots on YouTube is, uh, I still geek out on it. We, we've got hundreds of videos that we're constantly putting out. And I was reminded, by the way, that the uh, the clothing, trying to get stuck in clothing video actually was put out yesterday. So it's up there right now. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for joining us. Um, I appreciate you uh, joining us in this webinar. And if you have any uh, remaining questions or you just want to reach out and have a chat, uh, feel free to reach out. We'd, we'd love to talk talk with you. Take care.